With the surge of the Delta variant, even mostly vaccinated populations are reaching for another jab. UK scientists have found that the effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines falls substantially after 90 days. And this may mean that even largely vaccinated countries are losing widespread immunity as time passes. We discuss how health authorities are preparing for booster shots, especially now as the World Health Organization this week identified a fifth variant of COVID-19 that it's tracking with interest due to its potential to have high transmissibility and resistance to immunity. We connect with Dr. Simon Clark, Associate Professor in Cellular Microbiology at the University of Reading, and we welcome back Dr. Stanley Perlman, Professor of Microbiology and Immunology at the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics. Thank you both so much for joining us. And well, let's start with you, Dr. Clark. Now, according to the uh, WHO's uh, latest epidemiology report, uh, Mu has been listed as of interest because it has a constellation of mutations that indicate potential properties of immune escape, their words, not mine, becoming the uh, fifth to be listed by the WHO as a variant of interest. So what does it mean for the WHO to be monitoring a variant and what makes it different from the previous four variants of interest? Well, it'll have a different set of mutations. It means that uh, this is just another one, a, a different version that they think is of interest and may cause problems somewhere around the world. Um, even if it is very good at escaping the, uh, the, the effects of the vaccine, it might not be any more transmissible or it may be less transmissible than the current Delta variant. In the UK, we did have a, a small wave of, of mu infections earlier in the summer. Um, we're only really finding out about that recently, but it, it, they vanished. So that suggests to me that uh, it's not able to outcompete the uh, the Delta variant um, as things stand. Of course, if you change uh, uh, the, the the vaccination status of the population, that may shift. But currently, in the UK at least, it appears not to be much of a problem. Right, but it has been reported in over uh, 39 countries and the WHO said that mu's genetic mutations indicate uh, natural immunity, current vaccines or uh, monoclonal uh, antibody treatments might not work as well against it. And Dr. Perlman, while vaccines so far, they've helped decrease cases of serious illnesses and hospitalizations. Do you think this is going to start to weaken over time? Well, this is really the key question because I don't think we're going to ever prevent this infection completely uh, by either vaccination or prior infection. So the goal, I think, is to make sure that people don't get sick, don't get in the hospital, don't die from this infection. And as long as we're doing that, I think the vaccines are doing their job. So I'm a little less keen on reacting uh, strongly right now to people getting becoming increasingly infected by the Delta variant and others, because there's other reasons why this is happening. Not only is there certainly possibilities of immunity waning, viruses becoming a little more resistant to the antibodies, but it's also behavior. Human behavior has changed in the last few weeks and months. People have gotten tired of wearing masks and social distancing, of staying at home, and this will increase the exposure that people have to the virus. So all this has to be considered as we think about what the virus is doing and how the uh, pandemic is proceeding. Well, Dr. Palmer, unfortunately, it seems that many countries are reacting very strongly to the uh, um, continued global surge of infection cases caused by Delta and other variants, their worries surrounding other variants. And uh, the United States plans to start rolling up booster shots this month um, on September 20th for those who were vaccinated maybe eight months ago, although some reports say that the gap might narrow to five or six months. Mm. What does the booster vaccination process, um, what do you think it's going to look like? Well, I, I think that what we know is that there are some groups that have either waning immunity or poor immunity. So we know that people who are immunocompromised are on drugs for, for cancer, for some kinds of treatment, some people born with uh, immune defects, that they did not mount good immune responses to the first, either in the case of an mRNA vaccine, the first two inoculations. However, whether they're going to mount it to a third either shot or booster, how, how, depending on how you consider the uh, third shot, uh, is another question. And similarly, with older people, people over 85, they are, some of their immunity is waning. So they may benefit from an in, uh, increased level of antibody in their blood, 
but we don't know if that's the case really. We know the antibody titers will go lower. We know the sun protection, but we don't really know that this is going to have the effects we want in the absence of not changing other interventions, such as um, uh, being socially aware of the infection. And Dr. Clark, the UK also uh, plans to start rolling out booster shots this month. Um, what do you think the process is going to look like and who should really be prioritised in the process? Well, today, this afternoon, in fact, it was announced that uh, immunocompromised individuals are going to be first in line for a third dose of the vaccine. And there will be a decision made in about two weeks' time as to, uh, to whether to roll uh, uh, further doses out to older members of the public um, and the, the, the vaccination of children is another question here in the UK. So over the coming few weeks, months, I think we're going to see a change in policy and a change in the way that we administer the vaccination in this country. And Dr Palmer, what does it really mean to get a booster shot? I mean, are they different in design and do they work differently from the first and second doses? I think that they're the, in the case of the Pfizer vaccine, it's the same as the original one, 30 micrograms of mRNA. For the Moderna booster, they're talking about, they're asking for uh, approval for 50 micrograms, which is half of the previous dose. For the J&J &J vaccine, I don't think there's recommendations yet, but I think that from their original studies, the J&J &J vaccine would do better with two uh, shots to begin with. So they may well recommend the second shot. And I think for the other vaccines, it's a little less clear exactly what one would do, but I think it's pretty much the same as the original uh, vaccination. And well, with a lot of talk about uh, booster shots at the moment, Dr. Clark, there has also been some controversy over procuring vaccine supplies for booster shots. And of course, these booster shots do need to be uh, distributed fairly and affordably among countries. But are there any risks to foregoing or delaying booster shots with the rapidly spreading um, Delta variant and others on the loose? Well, if you let the virus spread, it doesn't matter where in the world it is, uh, you run the risk of generating new variants. Every time somebody gets infected, they become a factory for more virus. And every time uh, another virus particle is made, that's an opportunity for uh, generating a new variant that may or may not be troublesome and difficult. So we, we have to be able to prevent transmission where it seems to be happening the most. Um, that's where we'll get the biggest impact on preventing new variants. And Dr. Clark, how much of a boost would a uh, third vaccine dosage provide to a person's immune system and how long would it remain effective? I mean, are they going to have to be administered again uh, several months later? Uh, well, quite possibly. We don't know because uh, we've not really tried and the UK government has has bought recently, uh, I think it's about 35 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine for delivery in the second half of 2022, next year, this time next year. So it looks as though they are preparing themselves for further rounds of boosting of who knows, uh, come this time next year. Um, it's a distinct possibility that uh, it'll need to be done again at some point. And Dr. Palmer, recently there have been studies that show that um, vaccines, the, their efficacy tends to wane over time within six months. And um, this really also um, makes people question how long booster shots are going to last. So um, does that mean that, and also with some uh, types of vaccines being more or less effective against certain variants, does this mean that we're going to need uh, several boosters or a booster that is uh, let's say, the most protective against the dominant strain in your country? Yeah, I think it really is going to depend on how the pandemic plays out. So if we get to a situation where people are reinfected but have mild disease, then there'll be less pressure to institute the booster shots. On the other hand, if people are still dying and being hospitalized, then the situation will change. But I think it's so important that we not uh, react strongly to people being reinfected but without serious disease because of the issues that were just said about the rest of the world. If, if the virus is rampant in Africa, we're, we're all going to be affected by that ultimately. And Dr. Palman, there seems to be some um, disagreement in the U.S. on whether 
uh, booster shots are needed at this point uh, for the wider population and there are also some um, questions being asked about the safety of them as some people do react quite uh, badly to vaccines so uh, what is the current sort of uh, debate on this and what I mean, what kind of issues are um, health experts like yourself considering at the moment? Yeah, so I think that's a good question. The, we know that the effects, of, particularly for the mRNA vaccines, we know that they include uh, a mild myocarditis uh, in young males particularly, but we know people also die from that. We know that for the uh, adenovirus vaccines, there's been problems with this thrombotic thrombocytopenia, which is also uh, can be a severe disease in some patients. But we haven't really seen that the booster shots have induced increased numbers of cases of either of these diseases. I think it's particularly known for the mRNA vaccines. So that's why uh, we do have to be wary, but if it turns out that one really needs these boosters, then the effects, the benefits will outweigh the risks. But right now, I think it's still something that we still need more information about. And Dr. Clark, it seems that uh, the UK is going to start um booster shots for the most vulnerable uh, when it does uh, begin administering those extra doses. But, uh, well, does the type of booster shot you get really matter? I mean, does it have to be, uh, does it have to align with the first vaccine that you got? I, I think that's unlikely. I mean, um, I'm not sure a huge amount has been done of all the possible combinations and permutations of uh, the orders of vaccines that you might have. But uh, initial data at least shows that, that it doesn't really matter if you, you mix and match them. Uh, and I can't actually think of a reason why it would. I mean, it, it, I've always thought that that would work and that it would be safe. So I think that uh, in this country, in the UK, we are looking at administering mostly Pfizer vaccines uh, second time around. But of course, although many people have had that vaccine first and second dose, uh, people like myself have had the, the Moderna vaccine. And of course, a lot of people have had the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is a completely different technology that uses adenoviruses. And Dr. Perlman, with the uh, surge of the Delta variant, it seems that um, the initial 70% herd immunity goal is no longer uh, significant for most countries. What do you think then the new target should be? I mean, what do you see as the end game? Yeah, so it's, it's, I think it's hard to know. I, I hear numbers bandied about like 85 percent, 90 percent. But again, the, it depends what our goal is. This isn't a disease like measles where we can really get uh, if, if, uh, immunizing or sterilizing immunity where people will not be reinfected. So I think that the, what I would say is the higher the percentage, the better. If we hit 80 or 90 percent, I think we'll be better off. But I don't know that 90 percent will be optimal if this turns into basically a cold virus or be sufficient because cold viruses, we know immunity wanes. We know you have to have good immune responses actually in your nose and mouth to prevent uh, the infection. We know this still may be spread from people like that. So it's all, these, these kinds of goals are important. I think we want to get as many people as vaccinated as possible. But when we hit 90%, I don't think that we should say, oh, well, that's good enough. I think we want to get everybody uh, vaccinated if we can. And as governments uh, reconsider their vaccination plans, well, uh, Dr. Clark, um, now they're they're now having to consider what to do with school children as kids go back to school. Now, countries around the world, they're planning to in inoculate middle and high school children. And England, of course, is set to start offering vaccinations for children um, above 12 this month. How will it be coordinated? And are there additional safety measures needed um, in, in addition to the vaccines to really minimise disruption to learning and also spreading um, the spread of further uh, infections? Well, no, no decision has actually been made yet as to whether to start vaccinating uh, children over 12. We are already uh, vaccinating 16 and 17 year olds, and that was a, a big enough hump to get over. That was difficult enough. Uh, so we'll see what decisions are made along with boosting for, for that younger age group. Uh, but I imagine it will be done in schools. I don't think it will interfere with the rest of the uh, the, the vaccination program. We have quite, we have very good infrastructure, in fact, in this country for delivering the vaccine. We've just got to get people to take it. But the decision on, on 12, 13, 14 and 15 year olds still hasn't been made formally. 
Right, well, due to time, this is where we'll have to leave the interview, but that was Simon Clark, Associate Professor in Cellular Microbiology at the University of Reading, and Stanley Perlman, Professor of Microbiology and Immunology at the University of Iowa's Hospital and Clinics. Thank you both for your time You're today. Welcome. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Good night. And to our viewers, as always, thank you very much for watching.